Thank you very much. Uh, so I learned uh, earlier from uh, Joey that if you're from the Media Lab, I'm, I'm supposed to say things that you don't really understand. Um, and hopefully I will fail in that and you, and you will understand. I, I don't know. Um, I'm going to focus uh, today's uh, talk on a, actually a very specific project that we're working on at the Media Lab uh, together with Maury here. Um, and I'll, I'll get to that. Um, this actually is, uh, is Bristol, England, um, and this is a garden, um, but uh, not, uh, not any garden. Um, uh, it's a very specific one. Um, it's called, uh, it's in Bristol, it's called Seeds of Change. And this is, um, this is actually an artwork by uh, the artist Maria Teresa Alves, um, and it's what she calls a ballast garden. Um, and a ballast garden, um, this is sort of the first of them. Uh, uh, and nobody's ever thought about that before. Nobody's ever built one before. And what is ballast? Um, and ballast is the part of the ship that's basically below the water. Uh, and you know, you, if you've ever been on a ship or if you know physics, you understand that if that's too light, uh, if that doesn't have anything in it, uh, the ship will just uh, keel over. And so what was traditional for hundreds and hundreds of years for all the sailors who were going back and forth between different continents and bringing stuff on the, on the ship itself, what they would do is they would have to, they would have to weigh down the ballast uh, down there with, uh, with stones that they would find uh, wherever they were. Um, and uh, they would use more or less stones. Sometimes they would pick up stones in Spain and they would get to Florida and they would dump some stones there. Or sometimes it was the other way around. Um, but always it was this idea that they would just take rocks from whatever place they were leaving from, put them in the bottom of the ship and then go uh, wherever it was that they were going. Um, uh, that there you can sort of see the, the, uh, the, the infrastructure. That's all the rocks down there at the bottom. And the thing is, is, is that, so this is in Florida, and these are actually, uh, these are rocks that, that were, that were uh, just recovered that actually came from Spain. Um, and that wasn't the cargo. That wasn't, the ships weren't there to deliver Spanish rocks, which were useless. Uh, they were, it was there to deliver who knows what, uh, and sort of dump these over the side. And the thing is, is that the, the rocks in Spain um, actually uh, were covered with, of course, Spanish dirt. And uh, in the Spanish dirt was, of course, Spanish seeds. And in that, you see how you could grow a garden, essentially a Spanish garden, uh, there in Florida. And what uh, Maria uh, Alves has done in Bristol, uh, England, uh, is grow the garden that was actually uh, planted by ships. Uh, that was that was sort of accidentally generated through the sort of invisible cargo uh, that that came with it. That's what the ballast garden is, and so that's why in Bristol, England, marigolds are growing from the Mediterranean, and Eruca sativa from northern Africa, and oats from the Middle East, and ficus carica, and so on. These are all sort of quiet migrants, right? These are sort of like the silent passengers that came with all the stuff that the ship thought that it was doing when it landed. And um, the thing is, is, is that no captain was ever aware of how much of their cargo was actually alive down there. And the thing is, is, is that neither are we. Um, none of us are really aware uh, of that 90% of us, uh, genetically speaking, that's not human. That's all the everything else, as surely as the garden grows inside the ship. Um, all the parts of us that aren't organs or flesh or muscle or any of the stuff that we sort of derive out of DNA from our parents. Um, the other 90%, um, sometimes we pick it up by moving somewhere like the ships did. Sometimes we drop it off. Um, and it's no more obvious to us when we do that than the captain moving dry goods across the ocean. And we live our whole lives pretty much unaware of this. And they're un we're unaware of it at this scale, and we're certainly unaware of it at the urban scale. If we're just beginning to understand what's happening down here, we really are just, we're at the very, very cusp of beginning to understand its dialogue with everything that's happening all around us. And that's what we're sort of interested in exploring, um, is what is 
what is that relationship and what does it mean and where does it come from and what is it that we're actually carrying and where does it go? And in thinking about how to bring that to life, we started with inspiration from a group of artists called Attica, uh, Jack Schultz and uh, uh, Timo Ar uh, Arnall. And they had done some very beautiful work on what they called immaterials. And this is, uh, they, were, they were trying to show the invisible world of uh, RFID. And this is basically showing uh, uh, the electromagnetic field around a chip. Um, and that's interesting. And then they sort of, you know, nobody had ever seen that before, right? There's this invisible force, this inv invisible electromagnetic force. And they became, uh, they discovered these sort of techniques to make that visible. And then they extended that to an urban scale to do the same thing for Wi-Fi. And so what you see them doing here is measuring the Wi-Fi signal uh, and then doing time exposures of that. And they, they basically have done this very beautiful work to reveal the invisible world uh, that's inside of our cities. But let's face the facts that that invisible world is nothing, you know, compared to this weird invisible empire of life uh, that's all around us all the time. Um, so uh, in thinking about how to, how to bring that to life, I was, I sort of, the first thing I came across was a, a paper from years ago uh, which said, uh, which were some researchers uh, who had discovered uh, that by, uh, that they could basically detect the, the microbiome of the subway in Hong Kong. Um, and that you could, you know, sort of derive some understanding of who had been on the subway uh, uh, and where they had gone and what had happened in there from the microbiological material left behind. And let's be clear, I don't mean the DNA of the people who were there, I mean all the cargo uh, that was with them, right? Things that come out through the skin, through the mouth, when you cough, when you spit, all the things that people do uh, that they leave behind that isn't really them. Uh, and that you can start to learn something about the world once you can track that. And we said, okay, so I brought in the guys that had done the materials work and we said, all right, let's do that. Let's, let's reveal the city the way you guys have revealed the city for electromagnetic material, but let's do that for microbiological material all around us. And so we sort of set out to work. Uh, one of the people that we started working with is Joe Davis, who's at Harvard, among other places. He's an artist uh, who works with biological material uh, uh, and biological ideas uh, quite frequently. And then we spent a bunch of time over uh, at the Wies Institute at Harvard. And we came up with a bunch of different ideas uh, and principles about how amazing this would be. And then we met reality. Uh, and reality is played here uh, by George Church uh, at Harvard who explained to us that everything that we wanted to do was basically impossible. Uh, that, in fact, the idea that you could just sort of detect what was happening in the air from the air is not really a real thing that real people can do uh, in the present. That what you need to do, if you really want to see what's happening around you, is you need to get material from somewhere. You need to get stuff, like stuff that you can pull apart to tease the DNA out of it. Uh, in order to actually begin to understand what's happening. And so the question is, where is that stuff going to come from? And what is that stuff? And how do, we, how do we gather? What is the material that we can actually begin to work with? And so I had become interested in, um, in this work and in this particular rabbit. This is the Anamite striped rabbit. It lives in the, uh, in the mountains of Vietnam. And it had been thought to be extinct. Um, and it was sort of, nobody knew if it was extinct or not because nobody had seen one in, so, in maybe, let's say, 20 years. But just because you can't see it, you don't know. I mean, it's a rabbit in the mountains. There could be five of them, and you, how would you know? And so they set out to try to trap them. They set out to try to photograph them, and nobody could do it. And it was this researcher, Tom Gilbert, the University of Copenhagen, who figured out how to find out if the uh, Anamite striped rabbit was there in the mountains. Um, and he came up with the very clever solution of asking a leech, uh, of asking leeches. Um, because the leech uh, sucks the blood of anything it comes into contact with. There are many more leeches than there are research assistants in the world, uh, certainly in Vietnam. And uh, the leeches carry the DNA of whatever they take the blood from. And that if you can just gather up a bunch of leeches and learn how to interrogate what they are carrying, you could begin to learn what they'd been in contact with and where. And it was by asking leeches 
that Tom Gilbert's team was able to establish that the Anamite striped rabbit was still alive, even though they couldn't see it yet, even though nobody had found it yet. They were able to understand that this is, you know, that, that, that by asking, if you can ask nature the right questions, it will tell you something about the rest of nature. And this is present, you know, if this seems like, uh, you know, far-fetched, um, just uh, experimental science, you can actually find this playing out for real in cities. Um, this is how it played out in Brooklyn, uh, the red honey problem. Uh, this was a couple years ago. So urban beekeeping is very popular in Brooklyn. Uh, you, need, uh, you need a beard and a roof uh, are the two criteria. And uh, they, these guys had been uh, keeping bees on the roof. They were getting the honey from it. And they went to get it one day, the honey, and it was bright red. And if you are a beekeeper, this is not good news. Uh, it means that there's the bees have got into something, and you don't know what it is, uh, and it's not obviously natural. Uh, and so these, uh, the beekeepers had to figure out where that had come from. Now, the thing about bees is, is that they have a couple of very specific properties. They're much better than leeches to ask questions because bees have a home, and they always come back to the home. They're only going to go so far... Uh, and they're always going to come home, and they're going to you know, bring back whatever material they come into contact with. So they had to figure out what the bees had come into contact with that was producing the red honey. Um, the answer, it's probably obvious to most of you, uh, is a maraschino cherry factory uh, in Brooklyn uh, that, that uh, had this sweet sugar uh, that the bees were basically getting high from uh, and bringing back to the hive. Um, this was sort of like the, the big idea, uh, was realizing that if you could, uh, that bees, which have an urban habitat now, uh, can tell you an awful lot about the city, uh, even things that you don't even necessarily want to hear. Uh, the Maraschino Cherry Factory, uh, because the bees had gotten into it, came under investigation, uh, and turned out to actually be uh, the front for the largest marijuana grow farm in New York City. Uh, and it led the FBI to come in and shut the whole thing down, all because of a bunch of bees uh, that had uh, done, done their job, basically, done what bees do. Um, so when you ask bees a question, uh, you have to sort of understand that you have no idea where the answer will lead you. Um, so if we learn something about Brooklyn, um, we wondered, what could we learn about Tokyo? And as we started this collaboration between the Media Lab and Mori, we asked, what, what might we learn about Tokyo? And if bees can tell us all this about maraschino cherry factories, what else could they tell us if we could figure out how to ask? And so we thought, OK, we'll just make uh, beehives. Uh, these are called flow hives. Um, and we'll just have some magical machine down here that will uh, analyze the honey real time and just uh, send us that material. And again. Uh, first of all, bees don't really like the flow hive at all, um, uh, first of all. Second of all, it turns out honey is antimicrobial. It has, <laughs> it's a terrible idea. Uh, and, uh, and third of all, that machine doesn't exist. Um, and also, if the machine did exist, um, uh, one thing that bees really don't like uh, is strong electromagnetic frequencies. Um, so almost everything about this idea is terrible, uh, but it brought us to uh, the, the actual parameters that we had to use uh, to get somewhere. So the strategies, as it turns out, for working with bees as citizen scientists, the strategy for using bees to reveal the microbiological world around us are one, we use the existing urban hive infrastructure. Don't try to introduce some new kind of hive, whatever. There are, there are hundreds, sometimes thousands of hives that exist in cities. There's an awful lot in Tokyo, for those who don't know. Uh, number two, find better material in the hives than honey. Honey's terrible. Uh, but be, there's all kinds of other stuff that, that bees get into uh, uh, in the hive that we can start to work with, which I'll show you in a minute. Uh, and three, figure out how to collect the material that's in there for analysis in the lab rather than trying to do that on site. So first of all, uh, we started working with existing hives. Uh, these are some hives in Brooklyn. Uh, and uh, these are some hives that we haven't, we're not working with currently, but we're actually setting out to work with right now. Uh, the, the Ginza Honeybee Project, these are some hives in Tokyo, urban hives. Um, and ultimately, what we're trying to do is to work with the existing networks of urban beekeepers 
to turn those into kind of microbiological weather stations, right? Microbiological uh, beacons for what is happening immediately around uh, those hives. So there's a couple hundred in Tokyo, and can we find out what they know? So now, the thing is, is that with hives, um, some hives work better than others because in general, um, most beehives uh, that people use are optimized to get honey. They're not really optimized for what the bees want. Um, we, we want happy bees, um, and so, so there's actually a tension in that. Um, but either way, we had to figure out, it's not really about the honey uh, for us, for our purposes, uh, so we could work with pollen. And here you see, so how do you get the pollen? Uh, this is something called a pollen trap, and it basically, it forces the bees to kind of squeeze through a space that's uh, a little bit too tight for them, and it, it, it kind of gets the extra material that they've collected from the world uh, off their body and, and traps it uh, so that you can collect it easily. Um, but ultimately, it turns out that the best stuff to work with is what's euphemistically called bee debris, uh, which is basically bee poop, uh, uh, bee garbage. Anything that the bees don't want, uh, we call it bee debris. Uh, it falls to the bottom of the hive. You can see uh, a research assistant, Devorah, gathering it there uh, on the upper right. It's uh, the way that hives are designed right now, it's sort of the waste. It's sort of, it's, it just sort of just goes kind of nowhere uh, and uh, is not, uh, awesome to deal with, but uh, we started collecting that and testing that, and it turns out, uh, you know, because ultimately, just to you know, bring it back to what I was saying, we can't pull DNA from the air, but we can pull it from the material that was surfaced for us by the bees uh, all around us. And uh, once you have it, uh, here's uh, Jun Fujiwara from uh, Mori, who's uh, who's purifying and extracting the DNA from the material that we gathered from the hives. And then it goes for metagenomic sequencing. This is Elizabeth uh, Chris Mason's lab, which has been invaluable uh, for us as we've been working on that. And we'll, we'll come back to this in a minute. Um, because once we realized that what we're optimizing for is the bee debris, the stuff at the bottom, we had to figure out how to collect that in a meaningful way, a way that, doesn't, uh, that, that the bees don't hate. Uh, the bees are kind of picky. Uh, and it gives us what we need. Um, so the question is how to adapt uh, hive infrastructure to optimize for collecting essentially microbiological materials. So that's part of what we've been working on. That's another part of it. Um, and uh, this, is the, this is sort of a tray system that is designed by uh, Miguel Perez in my lab at MIT. Uh, and the idea is, is that um, this is inspired um, by old uh, photographic plates, right? Because old photographic plates had the same problem. They, they need to be exposed when they're in the camera, but they can't be exposed to light when they're out. This is the same thing, but it's with air, right? They need to collect as much material as possible uh, when they're in the hive, but when you pull it out to mail it to the lab, it needs to have a tight seal, right? So uh, we've done a couple prototypes of that. Uh, and the, the idea being to construct this so that it can be adapted for any existing hive. Uh, and now the realities are that all the existing beehives in the world, you know, no two of them are alike, right? They're like, they're, everybody just comes up with their own systems to try to make it work. Um, so the challenge of this is to design the infrastructure for interfaces between standard things like the, like the actual construction of the hive and non-standard world you know, where people use generally concrete to prop it up. Um, and it has led to uh, some decidedly uh, 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 unsexy uh, infrastructure that is really about sort of joining uh, these things so that we can get that tray and get the material that we need out of it. Um, so, Stage one in our work is really to work with existing hives to basically adapt them to be microbiological specimen stations, um, where stage two may, next year uh, is basically to start designing hives that are really optimized for this, which would look very different uh, and be very different than hives that are currently in use. So, uh, so we've been uh, using this with four different hives currently uh, and have begun to get back the metagenomic data that they, that they provide. Now, this is four hives, and the best way to describe uh, what it's like to gather this kind of data, 
I had the image, well, you just you gather it, and then it's like you take a picture, and then you can see what is in your material. And it's much more like uh, when, you know, when you would take a picture 20 years ago, and you'd have to take a picture and send it to a lab, and maybe three weeks later they send you back your pictures. That's what it's like. Um, and so we just got the data back, basically last week, um, and uh, I'm not going to go into any details about it, but I'm going to give you the, the top line on it because it's, it's super interesting and good news. Um, so the data looks like this. It's not very uh, exciting for human eyes uh, for a while, but we did learn as we started to look into it uh, some important and some interesting things, what seems to be good news, confirming these hypotheses. So number one, there is a kind of microbial baseline between beehives, right? So in other words, there's the thing there, there's, a, there's a sort of a microbial uh, a portrait that all hives have, seemingly. Uh, but there is distinctions between hives, and hives that are very close to each other look much more like one another than hives that are three miles away from one another. And that means that, indeed, what bees are gathering is different from hive to hive, which is obvious, but we had to test it. We had to make sure, and it's right, and it's true. Um, and part of what's important about the material that they are gathering is, is that when we looked at it, most of what we're finding is material that you would find in soil and freshwater sources, which means that we are getting really a, a real portrait of what the nature of the city around that hive really is. Um, and we need more hives over more time to get more uh, meaningful interpretations. Um, but uh, yeah, so we, we need more and better data. But also, in the meanwhile, um, we have to figure out now that we have some of the data to work with, how to build the imagination of something that's quite real, right? This is the core, I mean, this is, this is at the heart of what I'm actually interested in as a designer, as an artist. What I'm actually interested in is, is that all of this is around us. It's, you know, in the same way that it's inside us. It determines our survival as surely as it decides when we get sick. But how do we imagine it? You know, how do we, how do we bring that to life? Um, and you know what does it what does it look like? What does it what does it feel like when it's invisible? And you know how do we produce a culture that helps us understand that, like us, uh, and like the ships that carry us here, um, cities themselves might have cargo that might secretly be the captain, right? And that that may be the reality of that, right? That that it may be that we're living in somebody else's city. Then they outnumber us, uh, and just because they're invisible. Uh, doesn't mean they're not uh, captains of the ship. Um, so uh, thanks very much, uh, and uh, I can't wait to what what you're about to hear is going to blow your mind. So thank you. Yeah, thank you. Are you next?